My name's Kate and I'm from Hornchurch in Essex. A lion ate my head. My name's Caroline. I'm from Sunderland. My orgasms are so loud, I got an ASBO. Hello, my name's Sue Simpson and I was eaten alive by my pet python. My pussy's been on question time. I trapped my pedo husband by posing as a teenage girl. Then I shot him to the cops. I speak cow. Look at that one. Gutted and left holding my bits in the a, a towel. Look. That is disgusting. My baby takes Viagra. No wonder baby's constantly smiling if he's on flaming Viagra. Secret sex change. change. No, but I don't feel that's very fair on the kids myself. Don't you? No. What, their dad turning into a woman? <sighs> True life stories. The extraordinary things that happen to ordinary people. There's an insatiable appetite for these tales. They're read by seven million people every week, and they've spawned a multi-million pound magazine industry. My girlfriend dumped me by faking her own death. It's hard to believe that someone you loved and cared about could, could do that to you. You know, um, it's quite shocking, and just really is it's hard to believe the lengths that she went to to follow it up, even after she'd so-called died, she was still sending me information via this friend of hers about funeral arrangements and how she'd been up to her last days and, you know, it's just, it's beyond belief. Can you believe in true life stories? Where do you start to find them? And when you do, what persuades someone to reveal their deepest secrets? We followed true life journalists to find out how they uncovered the most remarkable stories in the most ordinary places. I'm looking at um, a man whose privates were bitten off by an Alsatian and a woman who suffers from a condition called absent vagina syndrome. What was that about? Um, I was just trying to track down a guy who um, had an erection for seven years. Uh, who else have we got? This was a story about body dysmorphic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, really wrinkly skin. My husband dumped me after I was raped, 18 stone and lost my virginity. The youngest person in the UK to have a sex change, two wombs. I won't stop using sunburns till I get cancer. Karen Pasquale Jones is a former editor of Love It magazine. She's one of the UK's leading true life journalists. Ronnie, it's Karen Squally Jones. How are you? I finished the first draft of the story and um, just wanted to read it over to you so you can get a flavour of it because obviously it's written in real lifestyle, which um, I, I don't know if you read those magazines, do you? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So it's written in that style. It's written, you know, with scenes and everything, like a little novel that shrink wrapped down. Finally, the nursery teacher handed me a wad of papers. I've written a report, she said. I think Anne Moore's autistic. For a split second, I couldn't breathe. I glanced over at my little beautiful boy perched on the chair and I was suddenly gulping back tears. Right then, at that moment, he died. I've worked in yep. celebrity magazines, I've worked in newspapers, national ones, um, I've done news, I've done features, and true life is, for me, where it's at. It's absolutely brilliant. My name's Paul from Liverpool. I work as a cavity wall technician. I uh, fell off the back of a van and got impaled on a broomstick handle uh, on my backside. My husband wore a wedding dress to our wedding. <laughs> my daughter grew another head. Basically, the first thing I seen, obviously, I didn't see what happened when it happened. I just looked down and I basically just seen that between my legs. That was it. Bloodstained brick. Oh no! You just Look, you don't need to look. You don't need to see the broom. Oh, that's disgusting. I like the turtle brush of death. <laughs> I've had kinky sex with a bishop. Bishop loved the idea that nuns were watching us while we had sex. And he loved me to dress up as a nun and not have a nun's habit. 
and I would regularly wear it. And he would dress up in his bishop's outfit. So it was a very um, religious ceremony. Are you still there? In real life magazines, you, there are certain um, uh, types of stories that will always sell and, f and literally fly into magazine. Uh, TOTs, triumph over tragedies, womb tremblers. Womb tremblers. Yeah. When it's about motherhood and babies and everything to do with children, it, it is a womb trembler. It makes your womb tremble. OK. And, um, and the woman, um, the heroine woman, is she definitely going to um, be interviewed? Yeah. I think that'd be good for it's a big sharing experience and you know when you get women together they don't bitch and talk about things that men think they do talk about they talk about these common experiences and and that's what you know a whole magazine embodies really my name is Sadie I'm from Holbeats Lincolnshire um, I was made to poo in a bucket for seven years by my evil stepdad can you believe that somebody had to poo in a bucket Come and have a look at this. Oh no, that's disgusting. My father and mother split up, so she met somebody else. And he didn't want her to use the toilet, so she had to poo in her room. Oh, in you're a bucket. Yeah, no. He is sick, very sick. I just stay out of his way when he's like that. She warned me, made me watch while he hit mum. Oh, bless. Why would you want to stay with a man that wanted to do that? That made your kids do that? Yeah, no. No, that's disgusting. That. Telling my story was a good experience. Um, it means everything's out in the open and I feel a lot more confident and a lot. I, I feel proud of myself for actually speaking out about what happened to me. All right then, bye, bye. They always ring, don't they, when we're fee it's fee time? OK. No. There's nowhere where you, where you can't trip over a real life story, literally. Sitting on a bus, someone will tell you a great story. Sitting on a plane, you know, there are loads of places. If you, if you just hang around anywhere, they'll tell you mums. You know, you go to a baby and toddler group, there's always mums telling you even about their traumatic labour or how their baby almost died or anything. There's a market for, that, for all those stories and you will find one. You, and you haven't been a real life story yet, have you? But you were nanny. It helps that the most successful true life journalists come armed with a checkbook. How much would you be tempted to disclose if the money was right? How much would you want to tell the world the most intimate details of your private life? Sweetheart, how are you today? Feeling horny, are you, babe? I know, I always, always. <laughs> My name's Alicia from North London. <laughs> And I made my mum talk dirty for cash. Yeah, I'd love that nice, stiff cock of yours pounding me, baby. <laughs> Lindsay from Rochdale falls unconscious whenever she laughs. She appeared in chat, which is bought by half a million people every week. Did you sell your story? Yeah, we did. We did sell a story, yeah. How much did you get? Yeah, we got £100. Pound. Uh, yeah, I'm happy with that. £100 pounds meant the journalists and the magazine got a good deal too. But these stories are hard to find. Angela Epstein is a freelance journalist based in Manchester. She's on the hunt for a story to sell to one of the True Life magazines. She knew Myra Hindley personally. She actually, she walked past her in the street and she, would she say hello to her and everything? And she, <laughs> she didn't. She had, <laughs> she had a laugh and a joke with Myra Hindley. You have to remember to get the person to talk to you. That's it. That, it's a very simple, I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but it's the old five-point plan. Who, what, where, when, how, why, actually. Make that a six-point plan. My name's Michael, I'm from Leeds, and my best friend's a cannibal. Unsurprisingly, when a former Mr Gay UK killed his lover and then ate him, it caused a sensation in the tabloids. That was over a year ago. But in the true life world, stories don't go stale. 
Hi, excuse me, I'm looking for Michael. Hey, that's me. Hi, Michael, nice to meet you. Nice if Angela can get a fresh first-person angle on the tragedy from the cannibal's best friend, she can breathe new life into the story and earn them both a windfall. Can you tell me exactly what your understanding is of what happened that night? As I believe it now, after Damien was killed, uh, he carved a big piece of his chest muscle out and carved a large piece of his calf muscle out the back of his leg. What with? Um, I believe it was with uh, his, his chef's knives. And he's, he's taken the pieces of flesh downstairs to the kitchen where they've been found diced up and fried and seasoned. Knowing the way he cooked and the things he liked to cook, what could uh, he have had in mind? He could have been trying to whip up a beef bourguignon, for example. Right, OK. Had he ever done anything, <laughs> I know it's a ridiculous question, but I'll ask it as is, that suggested he had a cannibalistic tendency? No. He never nothing. said, oh, she looks good enough to eat. Or, no. No, or, you know, never, or, no, never. But all seriously, or, or yeah, he'd ever no. sort of aired the idea, I wonder what, what human flesh tastes like. I mean, you're, you're chefs, you're, you experiment with food. Yes. That, yeah, that's yeah. what you do, that's yeah. your profession. But no, there was, never, there was never any sign of any cannibalism. Never. Uh, he's written to me an odd time. He, uh, he, sent me, he sent me a lot of menu ideas. Does the, the thought of getting menu ideas from a cannibal not turn your stomach slightly? It does in a way, but he was a very good chef. He was a lot better chef than me. Angela was pleased with her story. Recipes from jail by cannibal chef. She thought she might get over a thousand pounds for it. What would you say your main motivation is for wanting to sell your story? Uh, money, money. I need the extra money. <laughs> Simple. Is there something sort of a bit uncomfortable about the idea of someone making money out of their friend who's a murderer? I, there is. There is. But then cannibals sell. <laughs> this is my job. This is what I do. He's telling his story, and if he didn't tell it to me, he'd tell it to somebody else. Um, I can't wrestle with his conscience in terms of being, having chosen to do that in the first place. Hi, John, it's Angela Epstein speaking. I've got a story that I want to run by you to see where best we can place this. I'm looking at it as sort of further down the line, the fact that they've maintained the friendship. She didn't get her scoop in the end. Michael had already sold his story elsewhere with a clear conscience. For Angela, this was one trip that didn't pay off. Natasha Courtney Smith doesn't spend much time chasing down stories on foot. She lets the stories come to her via a website. You send your story in, and if it's any good, Natasha will sell it on your behalf. It's a neat business plan, because there's no shortage of volunteers. Right, let's just go to the messages. Each Monday morning, she gets together with her chief writer, Boudicca Fox Leonard, to go through the stories that have popped into their inbox. OK, her dad was a con man. She got depressed. She put on weight. Had a mental breakdown. Oh, God, it's so long. So what's that? Reunited oh. with a kidnapped daughter. Oh, our, yeah. How abducting my daughter has affected our relationship. <laughs> so Jackie married every decade for 40 years or something? Yeah, and there's a few magazines already interested in that one. OK. And then the squatting story. Oh, oh squatting. Yeah. You know, I don't know who we could send it to. We could find others of them, yeah. like all these posh girls, a like a kind of oh, now posh girls are squatting, etc. <laughs> I don't know if they are or not, but well, they've probably got friends, haven't they? Okay, let's send that out and just see if we can make that into a trend. Being first to the story is vital. They're up against rival journalists and rival publications. Would you like to get that story into a newspaper or magazine then? And with your eldest son, how did he die? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's send it to you. Oh, you've had your boobs done? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Well, what I might do is put that into a synopsis for now. Um, and if I've got any extra questions, I'll give you a call back. But um, I'll see what kind of magazines are interested. Bye. Bye. 
As well as the churn of stories that fill the inside pages, Natasha occasionally comes across a front page phenomenon. If you're the first in the UK to do anything, then, then that's a story. If you're the first person to do something after a law's changed, the first person to have a pioneering medical treatment, you know, anything that's a UK first is a, will make a story. Hi, I'm Henry. I'm from Essex. I'm the first guy in Br Britain to have bum implants. Show us then. Nice. Natasha sold Henry's story to several magazines for two and a half thousand pounds. Henry's split was a thousand pounds. That was before and that's after. Yeah. I think the one before was better than the one yeah, after. Yeah, that's certainly done. I want a bum like J-Lo's. Mmm. Henry White always hated his flat bottom, so he took the, the radical decision to buy himself a new one. Buy a new one? He had a nice butt anyway, so why yeah. did he do that? Yeah, but maybe because he wants a, uh, maybe a nice curvy one. Maybe it was a bit... But that's more feminine flat. than yeah. masculine, like isn't it? Yeah. It's a bit bony, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he ain't got no cushion in, has he? Mm. <laughs> and you always like something to get a hold of, don't you? Yes, definitely. Now Henry's having his bum adjusted again, and that means there's potential for another story. His assets have become an asset, and that merits a bit of face time. I, I recognise that face. Hi. Hi, Henry. Hi. The first one you had was more about shape, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. What, what were your thoughts on it once it had been done? After the pain and everything. How painful is it? Eight weeks of pain. Eight weeks? How much, like, pain on what sort of scale? Um, ten. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's it's ten. Say one to ten, yeah. say ten. What body are you trying to get? Like, who do you look at and you think, I want a body like... Just me. Just a happy, <laughs> just a happy me. I'm like, I think Peter Andre's body's perfect. Peter Andre? Hasn't yeah. He, he's, he's not as... Do you mean Peter Andre back about ten years no, ago? No, now. He's got the perfect pecs. Oh, I haven't seen his body recently. Since he yet. left Jordan and that, I think it's like his body's... Perfect. Right. He's lovely looking. He's got like it all going on there. It, Henry would consider having other surgery done if you asked him. He would have like. I would have. He'd have implants in his legs. He'd have implants in his arms. Would you? Yeah, you would. He would. So you're not bothered by the pain then? No. No, he, wa he wants the body without the work, doesn't he? I know I can get through it. Because you've done it before? Yeah. <laughs> so I know what I'm going in. So I've do you feel it. better equipped this time to go through it? Yeah. Yeah. So, nice to meet you, really good to meet you. And, yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Take care. We'll get you a good day. Nice to meet you, Henry. And you, all right? Bye. Bye. Natasha Bye. left with the makings of a new true life story. The same as the old one, only padded out a bit. Henry uses the money he makes from selling his story to help pay for more surgery, which in turn means that more stories can be sold. For everyone involved, Henry's bottom has become a gold mine. So is this just an easy way of making money? If someone thinks it's easy money, they're bloody crazy. Because if you know, I write, like, I'm right. Sometimes I think I'm a writing machine. You know, it's crazy the amount of stuff I write, the number of interviews I do, the amount of information I take in from people. There's so many risks, like, because you're dealing with another real life person who's, you know, often telling a situation that's very emotional. You can you can have the whole piece written, and then they they suddenly change their mind, and that's it. You are nothing. When true life stories break big, there's serious money to be made. Steve Hay is a new kind of publicity agent who's chosen to represent ordinary people rather than celebrities. He's got a potential new client, a man at the center of an extraordinary sequence of events. Hi, I'm Dennis from Coventry. A millionaire banker bought my wife. Dennis, 57. I fell for Slovakian sort of beauty. <laughs> 19, married her and life was perfect until banker enticed her with half a million in decent proposal. <laughs>
Can you see him as a yeah. couple? No. She's got a killer smile. When she smiles, you are finished. I think it's a bit more than the killer smile. <laughs> yeah. Look, what do you think of the smile? <laughs> it's a smile. Good. It's a smile. Good. <laughs> it's a story with obvious true life potential, and Dennis is being hounded. I'm the man for him to speak to, basically. You know, I mean, I, I have that experience uh, and I know how these people work. And I also command the respect of these people because they're my friends as well. So people back off. They back off because they know that I won't take any messing, basically. You know, you have to be tough. Um, you know, I mean, it's big business. Hi, Dennis. All right. Good journey. Yeah, well, to meet you. you gave me the wrong postcode. So, good to meet you at last. We've only spoken on the phone. Yeah. Um, obviously, we need to have a good chat about what's been going on. Your relationship with um, your wife, you call her <laughs> And you've been married seven years? We were married in 2002. 2002. July. How did you meet them? I met her in Slovakia. She was only 19. Right. We had an extremely close relationship. Now, you're obviously going through quite an ordeal at the moment. I imagine it's very, very hard for you. So I'm here to listen to you in terms of what you want uh, and if you want me to handle your media exposure and what support I can give you. My goal is to try to ensure that I'm being properly dealt with okay. in the courts. Now his young wife has asked for a divorce, but Dennis wants her back, and he's fighting the petition in the courts. So your campaign is for justice for yourself? Justice. Okay. And also, yes, yeah, justice, that's it. Of course. That's the word in a nutshell. Dennis's story has most of the true life story boxes ticked. When somebody files an affidavit, you must put the name of the party. What the Natasha certainly thought so when Dennis got in touch with her, at least initially. What, this guy's wealthy, or this guy's wealthy? I mean, that the other guy. guy. This one? No, no, D Dennis, the husband. Right. He's spending himself yeah. to Is he English? Yeah. And he married this woman? Yeah. So has she conned him? Well, no, now she wants to divorce him. It, the problem is that true life stories tend to be quite simple stories, and Dennis's story was turning out to be anything but. Now, going on further, what they've done now, they've abandoned that affidavit. He's like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going a bit over your head. I was like, yeah, you probably are. It's a bit complicated. Okay. I know that if the facts were known, I would get justice. Because Dennis talked for over three hours about his pursuit of justice through the courts. The courts have closed their eyes mm -hmm. to the proofs. Yeah. I think it was a bit too complicated. They didn't want to All this complexity it. left everyone quite confused. They like if the truth be known, they're beaten already. They haven't got a case. They're pretending to bat, but they've been bowled out a long time ago. The only way they've continued batting mm -hmm. is because the umpire is blind. I, I mean, you, you do appreciate that I'm suffering from stress at the moment. Of course. I mean, I, I don't it's know how so you stressful that I've got so much yeah. to talk about. Yeah, of course. That it makes you speak quickly because you're trying to get it all mm -hmm. out before you know. What we need to uh, be realistic about is, is the fact that we'll publish something that is of human interest and we'll get people to read that. It's a strong human interest story. Um, I don't know how much it, there's going to be a lot of interest when, when it goes back to court. Um, but, but who knows what's in it for, for Dennis financially. I couldn't say at this point. I'll certainly do my damnedest to get the most for him. So what I'm saying is, if I can trust you and you can trust me, we'll we can work together on this. We'll do it. You know, I've had people before who've said, yeah, I can do this, and, and they've let me down. And I have to say at that point, I cannot help you. Because you're talking to people here, you're talking to people there, and it makes me look stupid, and I'm not having that. So a lot of the time, um, I do find myself working, and I get very engrossed in what I'm doing in terms of attached to the clients. And sometimes I, f I find myself thinking, well, there is no mileage in this for me, but then if I can help, I can help. It's not all about making money. It might be to some people, but not to me. Three weeks later, Steve dropped Dennis as a client. Dennis wasn't listening to Steve's advice. True life stories are dependent on people being happy for journalists to interpret their tale. 
If you're not willing to hand over your story to be repackaged, it's unlikely to be published. I snogged a swan. My name's Miriam from Reading. I had my rapist baby. My mother's lodger bludgeoned her to death with a hammer and then he dumped her body in the river. I'm Anne from Dulwich and I ran over my fiance by accident. What happened to him? He died. True life stories are not just the outlandish and the bizarre, they also incorporate heartbreak and tragedy. I've still got to carry the memory of it. I've still got to bring up my children. I still miss Pat. Anne sold her story to That's Life magazine and used the money to pay bills and take her kids to Cornwall. What, what happened to him? Uh, we'd been out one night and he became drunk and aggressive. You're acting like a slut, Patrick Spat. <laughs> oh, How dare me. you? I didn't come for her to be running him over. Patrick even refused to get in a cab with me, so I went off alone. Once home, I, mean, I grabbed the keys to my burgundy VW Golf. He seized me by the throat and pushed me against a wall. Stop it, I cried, and he let go. Still terrified, though, I sprinted for the car. I climbed in and started up the engine. He drove off. He jumped on and came off. And suddenly, with an ice-cold shiver, I knew he'd gone under the car. I got out and saw Patrick motionless on the road Dead. in his brown jumper and jeans. Sinking down beside him, I dialed 999 on, the mo on my mobile. Hours later, I was weeping in a police cell when an officer came and said, your boyfriend has died. Now I was being treated like a murderer, not a grieving fiance. She knew what she was doing. How can she say she didn't Exactly. Know? I was acquitted of murder and manslaughter. All charges dropped. Why, why did you want to tell your story to the, uh, to the magazine? I wanted to tell my story because I was judged. Judged before I even got in court. People judged me. Some people don't know the true story. Some people won't believe the true story. They still want to believe that I'm running down. The difficulty with tragic stories is that they need to be packaged just like all the other true life stories. And that can be a painful process for the people in them and sometimes for the people who write them. Hannah Duguid spent four years as a true life journalist working on a number of major magazines. For Hannah, it all became too much. Something happens usually that will make it clear what you're doing and what you have become. And I think that's, I had that experience where I actually saw what I was doing and I was completely mortified. Yeah, people phoning me in tears or angry. Largely, the people in the stories were very vulnerable on quite a few levels. Um, I think in their lives, they were quite sort of vulnerable. I think hugely vulnerable because they didn't know what they were being exposed to. I think you would just feel very horrible that someone who'd already had a terrible experience was then having that made even worse by what I was doing. I think once you're churning them out, you can become detached from the, from the fact that these are people's lives. I think very much everything becomes a story. So it's no longer um, a real person in a way. I think that can happen. You sort of become quite hardened to what you're actually doing. I suppose it was kind of um, extreme and um, 
you didn't see people at their best, you know, it didn't show people at their best. Are these stories always true? Um, I think there's always an element of truth, um, but they then have to be made into a story. And so I think in the process of being made into a story, um, the, you know, the writing veers from the truth quite a lot, yeah, to make it a good story. Otherwise, if you told the truth, it might be quite boring. It's headlines that sell the stories in magazines. The truth is often a bit less enthralling. Derek the Swan Snogger was actually saving the swan's life rather than snogging it. Still fending myself against the adult male swan, I picked up the little baby and quickly breathed into his bill. I'm still getting pecked up the bum by the adult swan. That's basically the end of the story, so the little signet is fine. I'm Mark from Barrow Inferno, so my pet snake ate my mum. In fact, it just bit her on the arm before she fought it off with a cheese grater. And instead of growing another head, Nicola's daughter actually had a medical procedure involving a balloon under her scalp to stretch it and cover a bald patch. We didn't think that that, that headline was actually about our story. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was amusing. <laughs> the packaging of these stories with their exaggerated headlines doesn't necessarily matter, but some stories are an uncomfortable fit for the true life treatment. I had a sex change without telling my wife. Rachel Payne was hoping ideally to tell her story to a broadsheet like The Guardian. But the first opportunity to come along was Full House magazine. I felt I needed to let people know the kind of trauma that we'd all been through. And I really wanted the issues surrounding what, what I had to go through to be understood by the general public. It's a very difficult situation for a married couple to go through. This is the first time Rachel's seen how her story turned out. So that's it. This is... I feel very upset that it could be written like that and what I've done to make it happen. I'm just a bit ashamed of it. <laughs> What's upsetting you about the article? It's just, it's just the way that, the way that it's written. I expected it to be more true to the actual things that I'd said, and I think I was, a, I was surprised at how much they had been distorted, and elaborated, and the amount of invention that there was that was um, elaborated around them. But there's no way here for realising that in terms of gender, there's a spectrum that goes right across from one side to the other. Rachel wanted people to understand the complexities of her struggle, but she felt that the important issues hadn't been dealt with and that she'd been turned into a caricature reinforces the stereotypes that people have about gender. The real life story industry is really geared towards invention in order to excite the reader. And I feel that the real life, the, the, the story of the, the people involved, the subjects, is not really listened to. Angela Epstein is revisiting another big story. Amanda. Hi, uh, hello, I'm Angela. Hi, Angela. You Amanda and Philip Peake have lost their two young sons, Aaron and Ben, in a road accident. Okay. A footballer has been jailed for causing their deaths. 
Right. <laughs> Let's begin. Have you have you reached a stage yet where you sometimes wake up in the morning and for a second you've forgotten it's happened? I do. You do? I do that quite often and because I, I jump up thinking I'm gonna be late for school, you know, and it, I think I don't know how how you'd explain. I think you just you come down to reality with a great big thud. Are you replaying back often that day of the accident, particularly? It's the last thing that I see. After the accident, Phil wanted to go to the chapel arrest, and I refused to let him go because they didn't look like... <laughs> they didn't look like the two boys we knew. Even though it's been nearly two years since the accident was news, their stories still might be suitable for the true life treatment. Because now they want to adopt, but social services don't think they're ready. And we said, you know, well, we've got a home. You know, we're not, we're not that old. So, you know, there's so many children in this country that need homes and need adopting. So why can't we? How does that feel for somebody? You're, you've got a life sentence, and that, 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 that's, that was that's hard the fact. To, that's hard for somebody to, to tell with. you you're grieving, and therefore you're not in a position to adopt, but in two years' time you might be grieving less. That's ridiculous. It is, it's stupid. It is stupid, because you... I don't care whether it's two years from now or 20 years from now, we're still going to be grieving because of the boys. They were our children that, you know, any parent that loses a child will grieve for the rest of their life for that child. You know, we've got so much to give and we're not being allowed to do that. I feel that there's no artifice with this. You are dealing with something that is so incredibly raw. The rawness of the story, the rawness of the grief. This is just real life. This is real life. OK, thank you so much for this. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. It was very nice to meet you. You too. OK, thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. It sounds a horrible thing to say, but those are the best sort of stories. They're real, they're about real people. Something extraordinary, in this case, tragic has happened to them, and they're just telling you like it is. There's nothing fabricated, there's nothing cooked up. They are just, you're dealing right on the shop floor here with, with real people's lives. You can see how earning money from their story might be useful to Amanda and Philip. But there's a chance that untangling their grief in public is something they'll come to regret. Is it in their best interest to tell their stories, some of the people in these stories? It just depends what their motive is. You know, if you, if you have to force somebody or coerce them into doing it, then there's an issue there. When you don't have a person who really wants to tell this story. And that's up to them. It's the freedom, uh, the free speech. That's the, the beauty of our free society. They want to tell their story, and it's one that can be told, and then tell it. You have to stop yourself thinking about, well, what happens if I do tell this story. More importantly, the things that, that involve kind of murder, grief, loss mm. of life, very serious issues. Um, but the people that are involved in these issues want to talk to you. You have to stop yourself thinking too much and dwelling too much, if you can, about what goes on off stage. I believe we have to be nice to each other, be kind to each other, think before you act, if possible, have consideration for other people. My personal morals can't allow me to choose be incredibly choosy about what I do. I'm just here to ask the questions that people want to know the answers to. Have you ever had a great true life story and decided not to pursue it? No. She's got to go off for, chem for some chemotherapy. Oh, look at our little children, they're drawing pictures and all sorts for us. 
Oh, bless. True life is all about opening up to strangers, and that's something that many of us are increasingly relaxed about. My name's Sam. My 12-year-old son weighs 17 stone, and it's all my fault. Do you mind me asking how much you, you got for the story? 1,500, which is a lot of money. <laughs> Telling their true life story worked really well for Sam and her family, not just financially, but emotionally as well. My boy was born with a heart defect, and due to that, he wasn't allowed to exercise or overexert himself. And I used to comfort him by feeding him taking him to restaurants and I didn't like to make him cry. And becoming the story has even given Nathan the confidence to go out in public. Nathan's so used to being bullied and people calling him horrible names that after the we did the story in the magazine strangers came up to us and wished him luck and gave him some real positive feedback. To actually go through everything and actually say it out I, it was quite hard, and once I first read the story, it was quite difficult. You know, I got quite emotional reading it back. But after reading it three and four times, it really sunk in, and it was nice to see my life through a story. And it all made sense to me at the end. Nathan and his mum have seen the benefits of true life, and they're not alone. Natasha's on her way to meet a woman whose very private story she's just sold. It's a tale that has rapidly gone beyond the realm of True Life magazines into other media. But it's still told in the True Life way. So Louise is a lady who's talking about um, beating her shopping addiction. Um, she's had a shopping addiction for 30 years um, and it's basically cost her £500,000. She's lost her home, she's lost sort of everything because of it. We'll take her to the GMTV studios, meet the producer, and sometime after 8.30, I think she'll be sort of called through and onto the sofa. Oh, How are you? <laughs> okay. How are you? You're excited about this one. Uh, I'll tell you what, what, what... Excited isn't the right word. A, it's quite frightening going and talking in a television studio. But what I'm going to talk about is something very deep in here in my soul and it's like a share in an AA meeting it goes very deep and therefore it it affects your emotions so it's sort of tiring it can sort of wipe you out but it's truthful and it has to come from this deep place or there's no point in it at all hi we're here for James to meet Camille Solomon a number of the magazines competed for Louise's story And on the day it came out, GMTV were happy to follow True Life's lead and book her to appear on their sofa. Louise, good luck. <laughs> See you afterwards. Good luck. Now, for most of us, shopping, of course, is considered a pure pleasure. But for my next guest, her passion turned into an £8,000 a day shopping addiction and ended up costing her half a million pounds. Louise Walker is with me now. Astonishing. When you look back at that, you must think In five minutes on morning TV, Louise confessed to all her failings and mistakes. The very nature of an addiction, Lorraine, mm. is the fact that... Are you, do you feel amazed sometimes at what people will, will tell you? Um, well, people, people doing their stories always tell me basically everything, yeah. Um, I don't know whether I find that amazing or not. I mean, it's what I need them to do in order to be able to do their story, so I just think it's um, a necessity, really. They have to... They have to sort of displays everything if you're writing a piece about them and about their life. It's when you come out of now. It, it's cathartic, I think, isn't it, for people doing it, to sort of have everything out in the open and to be honest like that. Lots of people might say, oh, you know, I would never air my um, dirty laundry in public or, or whatever, but there's no doubt that the existence of all these magazines, TV shows, Jeremy Carl show, all these shows, shows there's enough, there's plenty of people who, who feel that's the right way to do things. 
they actually spent. Over Louise was paid for her story, like everyone else in the true life world. But for her, money was almost a side issue. The majority of people who approach us are not talking about money. The money is an afterthought for them. And a bonus, you know, some people won't even mention money. And then I say to them, by the way, they're going to pay you £500. And they're like, that's amazing. I never, you know, never thought that was... It hadn't even entered their mind because their goals are something different. Far from being just a corner of the magazine industry, true life stories have helped change the way we portray our private selves. Are you all about it? See, it's over, it's over, it's over. Don't worry, you did really well. You did really well. So you feel better now? True life stories have taught us to get things off our chest, to find comfort in being honest with the people around us, to fess up and move on. It's an outlook on life that millions of people find uplifting. Some of the stories feel like, God, that's an extraordinary thing to tell, to pop, to make public. Um, yeah, but you would tell me that. Would you tell a stranger though? Would you tell a stranger about? You would about certain things. Yeah, if you, if I'm sure, you know, if you're, if you've just given birth, you'll talk about things you wouldn't dream of talking about with people. And people will ask you. People on buses will say to you, "And did, did you have to get cut down there?" It's private stuff quite often, though, isn't it? Yeah, but. You know, that's a very middle class thing to have said. In, in, often in working class environments, everyone's talking about these things and actually amongst themselves, and especially women. Women really share everything. I don't know, just seeing what everyone else is up to, I suppose. And um, like some half. of the things that people want to tell the world, I think it's quite surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Like having a boom around. up your bum. I mean, that story you'd keep <laughs> to yourself, wouldn't you? I think sometimes they're a quick read, aren't yeah, they, really? Yeah. And you're sort of... It's not a book, but you've read somebody's no, life no. story. <laughs> yeah. You know, people read these to just simply, you know, finish their magazine and think, my life is OK, I haven't been raped, I haven't, you know, um, lost a leg, I haven't lost a child, I am OK, you know, here's, here's people whose lives have been devastated and they're still getting up in the morning and finding reasons to carry on and, and they inspire those people to, to do better and to actually make the most of their life, you only get one. I love them. We just can't wait for them, like, when the boxes come in on a Thursday, we can't wait to just break them open and get them out so we can read them. Only the interesting ones, then. I think they're all fun. Yeah, because it's all yeah. about real life. I love, I love being nosy. Nosy? <laughs> you nosy person, are we? Yes. We have to be nosy, that's what real life is, isn't it? Add some more for in a minute to see the Walkers keep it in the family for brand new brothers and sisters. That's just about to start. Here on Channel 4, though, it's Chatty Man next.